with the screen. Yeah, we, are, it's mine. we are going live. You can start now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session on cloud television. My name is Monique van Dusseldorp. I'm going to introduce our four speakers in a second. But first of all, what are we going to do? We're going to, to talk about how you move from pay TV to cloud TV, or should you? A lot of interesting thoughts there, and especially a lot of experience that we have in this panel today. Now. Just to be sure, I am definitely not a cloud specialist, but I will be asking lots of questions. But you can also ask questions, and your questions are much more important. So um, if you have questions for everybody or one particular person in this panel, please share them with us in the, the chat, which you can find on the right side of the screen. So do this right from the beginning. I'll pull out these questions uh, when it's convenient in, in our conversations, but you can already start asking questions right now. Now, what about this cloud? Um, I will introduce the topic very briefly. As you will all know, most uh, TV operators operators have video delivery infrastructures. They have, made, they have to maintain them. They have machines, they have servers, they have player centers. What if you move this all online? What if you outsource it? What players are there? How do they help you? When is it a good idea to do so? And when is it maybe not such a good idea to do so? This is something we're going to discuss in the next 45 minutes. Now, let me briefly introduce our speakers and then I'll ask each one of them what exactly they do. First of all, Ian Parr, Director of TV Broadband and Infrastructure at BT. Ian, there you are. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, afternoon Monique. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Ian Parr. I'm the Director of TV and Broadband Infrastructure at BT. So I look after many things at BT in that portfolio, but I guess a particular note for this audience is my responsibility for BT TV sport acqui uh, content acquisition, uh, the head end and the distribution technology for that service. That, that is a pretty broad, I mean, both the acquisition as well as making sure it gets to the end users uh, via... That's right, uh, and actually the broadband part of my role as well. So I'm responsible for the UK's largest ISP infrastructure as well. Of course, we see um, the challenges of distributing our own TV yeah. across that broadband infrastructure, but also the challenge of OTT TV operators yeah. coming into our network uh, and uh, 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 to our customers. We'll, we'll dive into that in, in a minute. Ren, Ren Yanai, VP of Television and Media at Satin. And maybe you need to explain Satin as well, because it's part of a big group and active in a lot of markets. You are at the moment based in Prague. Tell us, what do you do? Yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Ren. As you mentioned, currently in Prague. In the previous few years, from 2011, I was the CTO of Cellcom TV. Cellcom TV was uh, the first OTT solution in Israel. So we build a solution on-prem and we also deliver a full end-to-end -end service for our customers together with a broadband offering. So we kind of uh, offer the quad player in Israel. And as from uh, beginning of January last year, uh, currently like uh, this January, I moved to Prague and I'm working for setting as a VP TV in media. And I'm a part of a huge group here in the CE region. And what we are doing in setting is kind of, or not kind of, we are building full TV solution, which is a kind of, uh, I call it as a joke, but it's not a joke, it's TV on a plate. Means that we are offering full TV solution from content acquisition to content delivery, back and front end, set of boxes, remote control, head ends, front end and back end, operation and knock, everything which someone can dream on when he talks about a TV solution we are delivering, definitely someone can have everything or can have just part of it. Before I left Israel, uh, 
I started the transformation and we are in Cellcom, they are about in Israel to close their on-prem solution and moving to the cloud. And definitely here in the Czech Republic, we are building like full blown cloud solution, which will allow us to expand and which allow us to be everywhere. So, so you I built your, yeah, you built your own cloud solution at the moment. Yes, with an amazing partners, but definitely right now we have a solution in the cloud which can serve everyone. Okay, very good. We'll come back to that. Uh, Helge Hoybraten is the CEO and co-founder of Vimond, or should I say Vimond, probably depending where you are. Helge, tell us what Vimond or Vimond does. And you good also afternoon. have a background in TV, eh? OTT for TV2 Norway, but what do you do now? Yeah, so my background was running the biggest uh, OTT service in uh, Norway. Now I'm running uh, Vimon Media Solutions and we provide the building blocks that everybody needs in order to successfully operate a cloud-based OTT service. Uh, as the competition between OTT services and so who gets to attract the end viewers are becoming more and more fierce and more and more global, we let our customers focus their effort on how they stand out in the crowd while we take the responsibility of uh, providing super efficient backbone components for the workflows of metadata, content, users, subscription, and curation. And we support some of the biggest media companies in the world, like Comcast and Fox and Reuters and, and many others, as well as uh, leading OTT services in uh, local markets. And uh, we're enabling reliable and cost-effective scaling from a few users to millions and millions of, uh, of users. Yeah, that's, that's a huge part. All you guys have to make decisions on enormous budgets. That's for certainly one thing we'll discuss, budgets. Uh, our last speaker, Mika. Mika Puralati, Head of Content Delivery and Technology at ELIZA. Uh, tell us what ELIZA does and what you do. What do you do with the cloud with ELIZA? Yeah, so my name is Mika and, uh, and uh, Elisa is the uh, Finnish telco and we are operating in two countries in Estonia and, and Finland and uh, we are the market leader in both countries in, in TV side. Uh, what I'm doing in Elisa is kind of heading the content delivery uh, which also includes the cable TV operation and, and the head and services to kind of uh, channel to get to channel acquisition and deliver those for for over the IP and over the OTT for the customers. Right, thank you so much. Now, um, a lot of operators still have uh, old infrastructures in place, or old. It might be brand new, but they are in place and are now considering what to do. And I'd like to start with Ian actually because. When you talk about uh, moving television services into the cloud, the, the, there is not that much choice, right? It's AWS or Azure when you work with Microsoft or Google Cloud, or do I miss anybody? I mean, it seems that AWS is basically defining the whole field at the moment. Is that correct? Because as I understand correctly, BT is one of the biggest clients in Europe of AWS, right? Well, I, I think it's probably a big uh, client. I'm not sure if it's if it's the biggest, um, um, but you're right. I don't think AWS are the are the only game in town for for media and TV services. Though I, I would probably comment that I think they're probably the the most advanced out of the, of, the, of the big three public cloud um, service providers, anyway, including Google uh, and Microsoft Azure uh, platforms. So you know we've got a good strong relationship with uh, AWS for our our TV capability and actually more broadly for cloud services across um, across uh, across BT. Now, if, if and I think your considerations apply to, to all the operators, if you have to make a decision to move uh, the services into the cloud, what are the reasons to do so and what are the reasons not to do so? What, what is the consideration there? Well, well, I think from, from our perspective, the main consideration is improving the time to market for products uh, and services in, in the TV space. Uh, and the use of public cloud services in, in particular, of course, we have a, a, our own on-premise cloud capability. But in terms of the public cloud provider, the big advantage is having a platform with a number of platform or software as a service offerings available to you considerably speed up your time to market uh, for product uh, uh, development. So you get a lot of agility uh, in your business from moving 
um, some of your infrastructure operations uh, and your platform operations to public cloud. And, and, and what kind of agility is that? Is that simply adding more channels or are there specific services you could easily experiment with or, or launch and, and take back when you launch them on the cloud that you don't have to build for on your own platforms? Well, well, it's, it's all of those, really. I mean, you look at the elasticity advantages of the cloud in terms of adding new channels and cookie-cutting approach and using the elastic capability of the cloud to expand your service. Absolutely, that's an advantage. But also as an environment for fostering innovation. Um, so development of new products and service, uh, services, you can do them far faster on a platform that already comprises all of the infrastructure capability that you might need, as well as increasingly uh, the number of media uh, services natively provided by that cloud um, uh, service provider. So if you put it that way, let's all move to the cloud, right? I mean, everything's going to be IP based anyway. So what would be the reason not to do so? Well, I, I don't. I, I think one of the challenges, certainly one of the challenges we've got at the moment, is is um, uh, you know we provide a broadcast quality service and, and a live sports service, which is a very challenging environment um, uh, and and a, a service to deliver. So I, I think the challenges that we see are, are are some with cost, running a 24 by 7 channel operation on uh, on a public cloud service can be. Uh, expensive still compared with running that similar capability or the same capability um, on premise. And I, I, you know, while there's an advantage in removing some of the upfront uh, capital expenditure from a project, um, ultimately you need to look at the operating expenditure of running that service 24 by 7 on the cloud as well. And we've certainly seen some challenges and 24 by 7 um, costs um, and uh, in, in particular the uh, getting content out of, of um, the public cloud services and into your favorite CDN distribution partner. Ah, okay, because there's no, the other part of the, the whole uh, system, basically. Um, and if you, I mean, it's very hard to compare because as you said, the capital expenditures, buying all the machines and hosting them and the buildings and so forth, mm -hmm. It's hard to compare when you compare it to uh, the operation expense of paying AWS uh, their monthly fees. But uh, when does the second become too expensive? Is this specifically for sports events or is it all over the place? No, I, I think for sports events, so I, you know, particularly ad hoc events, uh, you know, the elasticity of the cloud and the flexibility it offers, it, it's actually um, pretty good. I think the challenge uh, comes where you've got a plethora of channels that are running linear content distribution, for example, on a 24 by 7 basis. Then, uh, you know, the public cloud providers need to account for or want to account for every byte of content that comes into and out of, of their platform. So that's when it can become expensive. For ad, ad hoc, perhaps pop-up sporting events, um, then it can be very advantageous to not have to deliver a whole bunch of infrastructure for that event and then tear it down again. So the public cloud service is ideal for those um, for those event-based um, elastic services. Yeah. So for rare events and new things, definitely yeah. interesting. Now let's let's go to Iran because you've built up uh, in Israel. You already moved this whole uh, network to the cloud. Now you're building something yourself there to serve uh, a lot of different uh, operators. How do you see this development going? Is, is this what Ian says, sort of, you know, do it yourself for the base service and use the cloud for additional agility and, and flexibility? Is that the idea that you have as well? Or do you say, no, you really should do it all in the cloud. That makes sense. I pretty much agree with what uh, Ian shared with us as a concept. During 2019, I had the privilege to take decision in two different, let's call it continent, in two different countries in order to agree which part of the platforms will be on the cloud and which will be on-prem. Uh, I have negotiated with many service provider, ISPs and cloud solutions. By the end of the day, I think, and this is like, again, my point of view, uh, the platform itself, the backend and the CMS and all the things which are related to um, the backend in the cloud. It's allow us to be 
agile, it allow us to launch uh, a specific feature in similar countries pretty much in parallel to test everything. It's easy to develop, it's easy to maintain. And this is according to my point of view, how it's going to look like and how it should look like. On the other hand, when we are talking about the content delivery itself, the video servers or the CDM, cache servers, whatever, I didn't found a mechanism which will allow us to be in the cloud since it's very expensive to be in the cloud 24 seven, having like regular linear channels, which are like broadcasting all, all the time. There is a huge advantage to do and to use the elasticity of the cloud and to be able to expand in sports events and stuff like that. So what we are building is on-prem CDNs on specific countries. And when we need to have extra capacity, we can easily go and move to the cloud for the extra capacity for ad hoc events. Uh, so if I will summarize, my point of view is that platform should be in the cloud video servers should be on-prem and if extra capacity is needed for ad hoc events like sports, it can be easily used in the cloud. So well, it's pretty much- makes, uh, Yeah, who makes the most money in this world? It is probably the AWS. I mean, the, I know they have to first invest enormously to have all the capacity available, but now that they do and they're expanding all the time, mm -hmm. are they the big money makers in this industry? I cannot really tell regarding that. Uh, I cannot say that there are like huge price differences, for example, between the Google or the AWS or the Microsoft, they're pretty much kind of the same. Uh, AWS has the reputation of uh, regarding video delivery to be the first one, to be the facilitators, to be the one who are like setting the standards. Uh, on the other end, like everyone are like trying to close the gaps and maybe they will be able to close it. I don't think that they are earning too much money out of it. And, and I just think that there are like huge amount of costs because we are talking about hundreds of gigs that need to be served. And those gigs are not just like the caches, they are like routing and there are like a lot of networking machines which should be there and not just like uh, uh, waiting for a specific sport events. Definitely what they are doing there is they are able from on, on one specific day to serve us on a specific sport event and day after maybe to serve BT with the same service. This is definitely what they are doing. Uh, the fact that they are like more expensive than on-prem video servers is usually because companies like Setin, BT and the rest has already all the infrastructure and all the backbone and all the internet which is needed to uh, like I take part of the costs which are related to CDNs. When we are yeah. going to the cloud, they are like taking everything into consideration. And when I'm comparing my cost and maybe Ian comparing his cost, he already has like uh, the internet and the ISP part. So for him, it's cheaper just to add the cash service there. Yeah, 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 I understand. Helge, you are the CEO of Vimet and you offer cloud-based solutions and you work with all these uh, huge companies. What do you see happening? Um, it's not just moving to the cloud from an expenditure point of view and that it's, you know, that the costs are less. It also starts to make a difference when it becomes part of the whole production, post-production network and so forth, right? So Helga, can you tell us a little bit about that? So uh, first of all, let me say, say that I agree with uh, very much of what has been already said by uh, Ian and Ron. Uh, I want I you guys to disagree. Yeah, things, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, we'll You're building to that the same later. industry uh, together. I, think, I understand. First of all, yeah. <laughs> so, if you look at the pictures behind us, we have very much cloud uh, with us today. And 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 one of the funny things is that if we were to sit and have these discussions five years ago, you might find that we would be discussing how could we utilize the cloud. Now we're instead discussing. Uh, is there something that we shouldn't use the cloud for? So, and we experience this a lot with our customers that everybody is moving fast into the cloud. And the cloud is like where we, uh, uh, as a default say, that's where we're gonna put some good stuff. We have absolutely no, uh, no one asking us to put our stuff on premise anymore. That's completely stopped. And uh, we also see that uh, a lot of the stuff 
even the stuff that it might make for very big organizations it might make um, sense to put on premise because you have the mm -hmm. capacity to do that with people and, and infrastructure already in place we see that many decides to move that into the cloud as well and i think if you look at the broader picture here we're all as an industry seeing more and more fierce uh, competition globally we used to be protected by borders, by um, by licenses to uh, to send through airwaves in a limited uh, geography, we are seeing something we have never seen in this industry before, and that is the total democratization of the distribution of content. In terms of, if you have the money to do it, you can do it. There is no no regulation stopping you from doing it. And this will mean that a lot of companies that have been founded on being in monopoly, duopoly situation needs to rethink uh, where they are and what their value proposition is in order to, to stay alive and kicking uh, as we move on. And as part of that, moving to a more uh, neat, nimble infrastructure uh, is, uh, is certainly a way to go so that you don't have to spend this uh, enormous over, overhead on running, uh, on running your operations. And I find it particularly interesting that we this year have uh, set up one and are uh, about to set up another uh, totally new news uh, broadcasters with uh, output both uh, in the traditional TV uh, distribution, but also OTT which um, are putting everything in cloud. Of course, you can't put yeah. the cameras in the cloud. You can't put some of the basic infrastructure there, but everything that is possible is put in the cloud. And what makes it even more interesting is that the technical departments of these uh, broadcasters doesn't exist because they rely totally on an ecosystem of partners to provide what they need. And so they are focusing entirely on where they can be unique, which is their content. and. Uh, and how they operate yeah. and of course also how their service works yeah so it's basically they're outsourcing your whole tech department also frees up peace of mind and frees up time to focus on the on the content making and the content yeah and it's been a mind bending for us because we're used to we are very um let's say tech friendly our customer loves us because we have open apis they can do a lot of stuff of integration towards the stuff so they can create the flexibility and doesn't need to talk to us about doing a lot of stuff in order to expand the capabilities. But now we're seeing some new customers who say, we don't want to have that technical uh, cap uh, capacity internally. And yeah. so we have built together consortiums for these, where companies go together to provide a total technical stack for, yeah, yeah. for these uh, greenfield. Uh, you, you basically broadcast. solve the whole problem yeah, after the, the content yes. uh, thinking. <laughs> Yeah, Mika, um, you're head of content delivery, so you're very close to the content model at Eliza. Um, and you use Google Cloud. I mean, I just wanted to ask because everybody seems to be using AWS. Why do you use Google Cloud? Tell us about that. But tell us about the decision making when it comes to uh, putting your services in the cloud. Yeah, so so uh, the latest development, what we did was that we, uh, in, in Finland, uh, kind of recording is very used functions by our consumers and uh, the reason is that uh, the legislation is making the catch-up rights very poor so our, our consumers are used to record a lot of lot of channels and like in our case we, we are offering uh, two years uh, recordings for our customers and um, when when we decided to do new recording platform uh, and we we decided to go into public cloud we used to have on-premises a lot of storages and and servers, but when we decided to do new things, we, we choose the public cloud. Uh, I think it really doesn't matter to do use AVS or Google Cloud. It was only the, you have to choose one of those. So I think the both are strong in, in their, their section, what they are doing, and they both have pros and cons, but uh, in, we just decided to go with the Google, but our, our platform, what we did was design it so that if you want to change from another provider to another provider, you can easily do it. So there's nothing specific okay. uh, yeah. development made. But what you just described is uh, your subscribers can, and you have 500,000, I think, they can uh, rec record 
anything for two years. I mean, that, that's a, a special model, right? So that that's almost offering everybody uh, their, their own PVR. Um, do you do that all in the cloud now? So they don't need anything at home. They don't need to set a box or they don't need a hard disk to save stuff on. Or how does it work? So it, it has been always that it's a kind of customer point of view, it's a cloud recording. So uh, we, we kind of enabling all the channels where we have uh, by the legislation rights to do. So basically all the free to air channels is possible to record. But in the customer point of view, it has been always in the cloud. But in technology wise, we, we store those in our own data center. But now we move into the public cloud and we, we store all the content into the cloud currently. Okay. And, and cost wise, this is actually interesting for you guys, you know, it, to get rid of all the your own servers. And, yeah, so, so if you have everything on your premise, you have a lot of kind of uh, investment to do because those storages have ox of course, kind of best before dates, and you need to renew those storages and the servers. Uh, so there is a lot of investment what you need to do all the time. So when you move in the cloud, you save a lot of from the investment, but of course, then the operational cost get increasing. But in our point of view, what matters was the kind of total cost of ownership, what which was much, much lower in, in this case when we move into the cloud. Yeah. Okay, so also a good reason to move into the cloud. Now let's assume that um, these hybrid models might stay there, but a lot of uh, TV infrastructure will be in the cloud. How will this eventually affect the, the TV industry? The, we, what things will change once everything is in the cloud? Are there new tech developments that suddenly become super interesting the moment everything is actually in the cloud? Who, who wants to talk about the innovation that can result from this movement to cloud. I'd like to elaborate a bit on what Ian said in the opening here, and that is once you're in the cloud and not on premise, um, you have the ability to connect very much easier uh, different technologies like our products that are in the cloud, uh, customers ours plug them in and use them in their own architecture. And, I th and, and we do that, of course, again, with other uh, products in the cloud. And this is normal. And it creates an ecosystem where it's quite fast to utilize products that are out there. They get updated by themselves. You don't have to maintain them. Somebody else is taking care of that. Uh, and uh, you can uh, swap them out much more easily than it used to be. So you're not married in the same way as you were before. And yeah. this uh, and, and TV enables operators much, are used to, to, to do yeah TV operators are used to doing one type of software for 10 15 years right I mean they're, they're used to exactly. being you know having something forever and ever so this this would in principle make the competition on software level much harder I mean for the software companies very interesting I'll give you uh, yeah I'll give, yeah yeah absolutely it, it will but it the, at the same time and, and the way I see it makes a, a it's uh, there is much opportunity in that as well. Let me give you one example. There was a European broadcast and because of COVID couldn't uh, produce. They had to quarantine a lot of production people because of COVID. Uh, so they were sitting at their home office, not able to do uh, video production. In 24 hours, they were connected to our uh, cloud-based video editing tool, Demon IO. So in 24 hours, they were uh, able to do full production again um from a software they've never used before they they probably hadn't heard about it before uh, either so that's how fast you can move when things are in the cloud and up and running and all you do is connecting some dots and it also means that your workforce doesn't have to be in the same city country or, or continent even right i mean if it's on the cloud you can have your editors all over the place you can just get the best people or the cheapest people whatever you're going for but they don't have to be in one particular venue i, I agree you know um that uh, the opportunities for collaboration on the cloud are, are fantastic many of the partners that we work with in, in on bt sport for example are cloud native uh once you've got your media or your service on the on the cloud the the opportunity to collaborate uh, on that media with third parties and other partners is is fantastic, uh, and I think you know the, the disruption in our in our industry. You know, it's it's actually getting harder to justify on-premise deployment of certain services for media production. Um, 
and most large operators are already using cloud uh, services in some way, large or small. Uh, but you know, I'd be astonished if new entrants to the market um, uh, for media manipulation, distribution, uh, and production aren't um, almost completely cloud native in their deployments of, of service. Are there, um, you talk about new partners that you can easily cooperate with, are there also new services, things that you wouldn't be able to do before, but that now become really easy to, to you know, specific? I'm thinking of machine learning and AI and things like that, but there could be also all kinds of other new services that you can easily just tap into the cloud and make part of the offering to the, the end consumer. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quote an, an AWS service, the AWS recognition um, service is, is uh, something that you, you could do before, uh, but it's far easier um, to do than it has traditionally uh, been. And, and uh, machine learning uh, and AI type services uh, are all enabled uh, through this collaborative sort of ecosystem of cloud-based yeah. services that we can all take advantage of. I would like to add another dimension to these kind of discussions that we are having. Usually service providers were focusing on the operation. They had squads and many people who handled even like the hardware and the networking and everything. And they're like the focus, part of the focus was there. Since like we all move into the cloud, then the focus can move from just um, operating and facilitating the service and to be more like product oriented. Means put aside all the operation, everything is handled in the cloud. And now let's focus on what we need to do is to deliver a better TV and then to have a fast integration of new services faster integration of introducing new services to our customers and like making more focus on the product itself, on the UI and elements which at the past, like 10 years ago, were just nice to have. The most important part was just to make sure that the video is there. Right now, we all know that the video is there. We are moving it to the cloud and it will be, and it will be maintained by someone else. Now, service provider can also start and put more focus on the product itself. And, and what kind uh, of innovations agree. do you see and, happening there? What yeah, kind of I, innovation do you see happening there? Monique, because... Yeah. Yeah, so I have two examples, Monique, on innovation that was enabled by cloud uh, and that I've seen very difficult to do the same uh, on-premise. Uh, one is a partner of us. The company is called Mjoll and they have a product called Mimi. And what it basically does is it's an integration layer uh, towards all the different AI engines out there, so Amazons or Googles or IBMs or mm -hmm. whoever's. And, and they allow you to shop uh, different AI for different, uh, different tasks you want to do very easily. So you can one day use one, the other day use another. You can use both. You can use three. You can use four for whatever task you want to, to use. And they made it so simple that it's no integration work for you to do. It's just a matter of just clicking, enabling this or that service to disabling it. Another one is uh, there has been a lot of talk about personalization. And we all, we all know about these recommendation engines that have their strengths and weaknesses. And it used to be like you're more almost married to one of them. So then you can uh, you can uh, swap them out, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, it, uh, it's not an easy operation. What we did was we created um, the via uh, the, the Vimond um, uh, curation engine with uh, smart integrations towards recommendation engines. So now, just as Mimir uh, does with AI, we did with the recommendation engine. So now you can plug them in. You can use multiple. For some of your content, maybe one is better. For other, another is better. Maybe on the front page, you want to use a third. And you can uh, then use them and, uh, and also with human force curate on top of the recommendation engines. And I think this is way too complicated to do if, if not everything was in the cloud and it was easy to connect yeah. the dots in this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. If, considering that um, there are three major public cloud offerings at the moment, AWS the biggest, and then you have Microsoft Azure and, and Google Cloud, um, if those three are also going to be the ones that offer the best additional services, then we end up in a world where three companies have such incredible market power. This, this cannot be good for creativity, innovation, and, and a flourishing of, 
local uh, services. Is there not a single European cloud option? The market seems to be so huge. And my second question there, and I don't know if you guys can approach this. I mean, we have this, uh, the US Cloud Act, and recently, of course, um, the EU USA privacy, privacy shield was uh, rejected by European Parliament. So, you know, there was basically the US says, you know, if it's on the cloud on our on American machines or on American companies machines in Europe, basically we can access it. It is, this is not privacy related, we can access it. And then they, they made a special arrangement, but that arrangement has been rejected now. So basically, if you consider consumer data of what you watch and wear as personal data, we're in a pretty difficult place right now. I mean, all these services running on all these American machines or even running on something which is connected to a American machine in Europe, it should not be, right? I mean, who, who can comment on that? Because I think it's a really big problem and something that is not so easy to solve. Ian. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that could be a, a concern in particular regard to uh, consumer or, or, or user uh, data, I think. But I, I think, you know, the, the advantages of, of the platform and the capability um, uh, far outweigh some of the risks and the considerations that we have to uh, take on board on the kinds of services that we were, uh, 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 you know, providing at least in, in, in the media um, um, sphere. Yeah, it's absolutely a concern. Um, but I, I, I guess it's not a big concern for BT if you guys all step out of the EU. You, you lose all the regulations that we try to put in place. But I, I think uh, I, I don't know. I'm not a, <laughs> a regulatory <laughs> expert, but I, I would like to think that we will keep or retain all of yeah. the best parts of what we enjoyed uh, within our <laughs> European <laughs> membership and perhaps embrace doesn't or work like that. Okay, sorry, you'll find out. Embrace or enhance uh, even better uh, or higher standards uh, for our user <laughs> okay. security and, and safety. We, we'll, we'll see. No, but it's both market power and regulation. I mean, market power, if, if there's only three companies offering this, of which one is even bigger than all the others, this does this this seems problematic as such and then the second thing is that american companies and there's a regulatory problem there as well mika how do you see it from finland it's a it's a tricky question so i, I don't have an answer for this yeah no it, it is a very hard question ron well, do you see something up. happening because you've built outside of the eu and now you're building inside is there a difference or is it not something you're you're worried about at all Currently, our legal department is handling it, but I don't see like any major differences between Israel and, uh, and the EU. I think that pretty much the concept is the same. Definitely the regulation in EU in what is related to data privacy is more tight than what we had in Israel. But I don't see like, honestly, like any showstoppers which like should turn on some red lights around and some sirens around the corner that something bad is about to happen. I think that those huge companies, like we were talking about the Microsoft, we're talking about Google, and we are talking about uh, uh, Amazon, that they will like stop performing or stop following the rules. They have a lot of things uh, that they might lose if they would do something not according to the regulation. So I think that by the end of the day, they will adapt. Okay, okay. We have a question from the audience, from Mireya. Do you think that pure OTTs are more advanced in terms of cloud than pay TV operators? Is there a difference in the market? Where is the most advanced work being done? Who wants to answer that? So pure OTTs versus pay TV operators. In Anyone? General, I can try to estimate that usually the answer is yes. OTT are more advanced, but this is uh, the main reason is that they are like younger usually the, the the dna is like different than the uh let's call it the regular pay tv but i can say in the last few years the pay tv uh, uh companies are trying to keep the uh, the rhythm and keep the path because they understand that the uh on-prem solution and the old let's call it the old style tv is need to be adjusted and adapted and they are trying and they are starting to do the changes but if you will choose like 100 
uh, randomly 100 pay TV and 100 OTT. Usually the OTT are the more advanced one, but this is just my point of view. It's just legacy is not there and you can just start newer, start, start with new things. So, yeah. And you're starting Anybody else? Different. Yeah, I think what we see many places are that because of the fear of um, companies with a long history are doing it the way they always have, uh, they um, many are opening new divisions to handle things, uh, newer things like OTT. And one famous example, even though it was inside uh, the cable division, Comcast, when they were uh, upgrading to to centrally software-based solution instead of uh, smart boxes. So dumb boxes, smart infrastructure. They made a completely new team, hid it away, away from their offices, and they launched the X1 platform this way. And uh, we've been working with the Comcast Innovation Labs uh, on many things, and they do it the same way. Like they set up new projects with uh, new people, uh, and in that way, can leave the rest of the organization to ca cater for what they're currently living off from. And then uh, a small organization can work on the next big thing. Okay. I think that's typically what you see and it's typically according to Innovator's Dilemma by Christensen, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I don't think the question from uh, Mireya is a, is a no or It's yes. not one or the it's other, it's, it's a process. Are. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have five minutes to round up and I would like to ask each one of you, okay, Give me predictions. What, I mean, this can be for your own company where you say, okay, this is the biggest challenge we now have and this is where we want to go. Or it can be for the industry. Where will we be in five years? What is the, what has changed? What is different now in five years because of uh, this move to cloud or moving back? Um, Ram, let's start with you. I think that the challenge is what like, uh, the big five or maybe the big four will do and how they are about to enter the, the let's call it the our territory means like usually in the past if companies like netflix or amazon prime and disney were usually like a, a, an add-on uh, service like with a huge advanced vod library right now we all understand they are like stepping in into the regular tv businesses when Netflix are trying and having their demo in France regarding linear channels, Amazon are buying sports rights. So they are definitely understand that in order to step in into the TV business, they need to have like, uh, I cannot say the old traditional linear, but sports events and live events. And therefore it will be a challenge. The challenge is how the TV is gonna look like five to 10 years from today. It means whether or not they will step in and conquer like most of uh, the TV uh, subscribers around the corner or whether or not they will remain as a supplementary service. This is the main question for us as a TV operator. Yeah. This is That's the it's main question, not only for TV operators, for all the media companies as well. Everybody's a little bit worried there. Mika. Yeah, I fully agree almost what one run said, but the one thing is that the TV for sure will change on that when you have a TV in your home, it will be totally only screen and uh, most things will be in your phone. And uh, now, now we have seen that most of the broadcaster has also start building all their own catalogs and, and coming into the markets. So, so for sure we need some aggregators that you can uh, run your phone and what wherever you want the content and then if you need for the stream the content for the tv you can do it over the phone but i think the second second interesting thing is the 5g and and kind of cloud computing that might solve some cdn issues that uh, you don't need to maybe any more invest for the uh, specific streamers can you run those on the on, on the cloud edge that's something interesting what we will see will it happen yeah, that will completely change the architecture of the media industry as well, if it comes to the edge. Helga, what do you look at when you look at the future? Um, so I agree much with what has been said already. I think uh, key here is the mega trends of globalization and uh, the disruption of the old uh, value chain and the protection nationally. I think uh, another interesting uh, trend is the fragmentation of the audience onto niche interests. 
Uh, so I think, I don't know who is watching us right now in this uh, panel, but if you're working, let's say in a national broadcast or telco or uh, having an audience there, you have a very important job because you need to stay alive and keep local culture alive and, and be able to distribute local content, make services that attract, attract wide across so that we don't end up in a pure global situation with a few big players controlling everything. I think that's really important for democracy. I think we've seen it uh, many times over the last year that it's, it's serious. And, and because of that, I think also embracing technology that is uh, fast and easy and, uh, and uh, not as complex to run is very important because that enables organizations to be more nimble and to, to work faster. And if, if we in 10 years can look back and say, hey, we helped, helped the small guys in a way like big companies yeah. today, but small compared to the big five, uh, uh, survive and have as powerful services as uh, the big companies because we could leave them to really focus on how they can be uh, unique in the market then I'll be damn proud 10 years from now because that's it is a big big thing going on in the market thank you so much Ian up to you to close this panel with your observation for the future well, <laughs> that's well, my task I, it, now there were some great uh, some great comments there so what can i say in addition to what's already been said which i agree completely with by the way um i'll talk about perhaps some of the technology trends I and mean, i think uh, uh, mika alluded to it and i think we'll see more convergence between uh, mobile uh, and fixed networks and therefore content and services being more ubiquitously available across wherever a consumer uh, uh, may be and I would predict that uh, we will see more, you know, particularly over the next few years, uh, more uh, use of, of AI and VR type uh, services across um, that, those converged uh, networks uh, as well. You know, in regard to the, the, the behemoths, uh, uh, the, the large companies out there, well, they can pretty much do what, uh, what they want. They've all got very deep pockets, haven't they, really? So uh, if they see an opportunity, I'm sure they will, uh, will take it. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, it was a very interesting panel. Thank you all for contributing and uh, hope you stay around in the online conference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.